I'm a massive fan. Uh, I've been a client personally and in my own business, consulting business, uh, since 1996. Unfortunately, you lost me partially about two years ago. Can anybody guess why? I'm, I'm loyal, devoted. Uh, I know that you've got the best bandwidth covering, uh, the best wrist roaming in the world. There's a clue. Yes, thank you. A clue. Uh, how can I, as a futurist, possibly operate without some of the latest technology? And I found that you couldn't sell it to me, so I had to leave you. Very sad. I'm still traumatised. My wife has uh, took over the number. And she still uses it. <laughs> I know you can welcome me back, but now I have the hassle of trying to move my phone number back. But if you sort that out by lunchtime, I'm coming back. On my own. In the meantime, in the meantime, thank you. I'll talk to you later, Fiona. Thank you. In the meantime, you'll be delighted to know that I have actually been using bandwidth during this morning. I have been tweeting to my 42,522 followers. Uh, uh, musings on today. What I'd like you to do is to think about two things. Connect your thoughts, random connected thoughts. I want you to write them down as we go. I'm going to want to flip chart them out. The moment I finish, we're going to flip chart these things out. Your random connected thoughts that are triggered by what I'm saying, that relate to your world and other things. And secondly, I want to know what you're feeling. All right? So here we go. So this is a personal view. It's a customer view. I'm going to go beyond mobile access, and I'm not terribly interested in bandwidth. Bandwidth is simply a mechanism for getting things done, and I hope that you can do it for me. I was speaking at a Google event just the other day. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the CEO of Google in Europe said this. He thought that in the M space, they as a company are seeing more change in an eight week period, every eight weeks, than they think has been seen in traditional media in the past 20 years. Now I can't prove that or disprove it, it just happens to be a Google quote. I think it's probably a slightly colourful one for the sake of emphasis, but actually it makes us think about the speed of change. It makes us think about the speed of data and the quantities of data. Just look at this exponential growth. And what's really interesting though, is that almost all the growth in global data is in structured data. This is data that you can pin to an event. It's data uh, which allows you to watch my tie moving around this room because it's broadcasting using an RFID device every time you interrogate it with one of your phones. It's data that can be linked to my medical records, data that can be linked to my glasses and so on. We'll come back to that. But what does all that mean in your future? Uh, you know, we can concentrate endlessly on all kinds of consumer tricks using your technology. And the fact that many of my retailer clients are scared witless by the possibility that 60, 70 or 80 percent of their customers in future will just walk into a store, already it's about 20 percent of them, and just uh, rattle off 5, 10 or 15 other places that they can get the same product and then order it at the speed of light for collection within 6 hours from a company that they've never heard of. Now, you are I promise you, right in the middle of the most exciting transformation our world has seen digitally in the last 20 years. But I worry about your business. I worry about what a telecom company will actually be. I worry about whether there will be any telecom companies left that are, quotes, pure play telecom companies by 2020. Why? Well, as Chris is going to tell you later, and as you well know, so many other kinds of businesses long to just scoop up a little bit of bandwidth and telco and mobile stuff along the way, whether they're banks or cable operators or a whole host of other things, and I wonder what space there will be left for a company which is primarily still involved in data in 10, 15 years' time, and a little bit of voice calls will come to that. <coughs> so, I want to look through the customer's eyes through the customer lens and think about what it actually feels to be a customer in the future. And my question really uh, relates to our own experience as customers. Now let me give you an example of that. Um, but before I do, one of the things that worries me, I talked to people who are in the, in the, in the digital marketing space. The other day uh, I, was, uh, I was at a dinner, there were five people at the dinner and they controlled between them 50% of the entire advertising spend of our world on all platforms. TV, radio, press, internet. Just these five people 
five big advertising agencies looking at the future. And one of the things that worries me about their world is noise. Now, how do you communicate, how do you as Vodafone communicate with customers in such a noisy environment? You know, we can get excited about intranets and extranets and clouds and marketing and all the rest of it. We can think about tomorrow's kinds of devices. They get smaller and smaller. How small can they go? We haven't resolved the screen size argument. We can create a phone that's uh, the size of a, of, a, of a large grain of sand and we could pop it under your skin, I guess. We could, uh, uh, we could fuse all kinds of wireless technologies with the body in different ways if we wanted to. We can uh, make biological clothes. We can make digital clothes. We can uh, create clothes to a wired environment. We can create an environment where uh, chips talk to brain and brain talk to chips and chips talk to clothes and clothes talk to your environment. Uh, we already have games operated by thinking, can we stitch brain cells themselves into uh, the digital world? Yes, we can. This is a chip uh, showing human, uh, it's not, it's animal brain cells growing on its surface. I'm a physician in my first training, so this is interesting to me. Uh, these are brain cells which are growing on the surface of the chip and they grow connections to each other and as they do they get excited by those connections and they grow more bandwidth and they also grow into the surface of the chip and wherever they sense an electrical charge they grow more uh, uh, more connections in. Fascinating. So uh, these kinds of chips have been created uh, they have been inserted into mouse and rat brain they work quite well um, in fact, your brain tissue is programmed genetically to communicate with computers. Uh, brain cells uh, are just do it by nature. They just love computer tissue. They grow into it. Now, the big question is, uh, oh, now that we have animals that are routinely sending mental messages electronically using wireless uh, communications direct from one brain to another, one rat to another rat, those things are routine. I'm telling you history. This is 1993, 1994 technology. You tell me the future. The big question is, though, is this the kind of chip that you'd like inside your own head? Put your hands up if you'd like one of these inside your head. This is the future of telecom, folks. Put your hands up if you'd like one of them. Put up your hands if you're absolutely sure that neither you nor your children are going to be chipped in this kind of way. And the rest of you aren't quite sure you're going to put it in your strategy just in case. But we begin to learn something very important about the future. And if you remember only one thing, it's this. The future of telecom will not be controlled by clever innovation. The future of telecom, as Nokia discovered, is related to something far more intangible than that. It's not clever geeks producing bits and bytes or pieces of clever plastic or foldable screens. It's the future of telecom is about, it's about emotion. It's about the most important world which will drive the future. It's about a world which creates world wars and world peace. It's about a world which decides whether technologies <coughs> take off or whether they're into the bin. It's customer passion that matters. And therefore, if we're going to be clever and smart, rather than just a heavily engineered company, then we're going to need to become psychologists in order to read the future of telecom. So while I'm delighted to be in the midst of so many telco uh, uh, IT specialists and enthusiasts, we do need a reality check. Here's an example of it. The internet has made us uh, quite passionate about the issue of time, and very impatient, actually. Uh, most of you will know that uh, a website can typically lose 80% of its entire customers in 20 seconds. Uh, 20 seconds is quite a long time, but a very short time to lose most of your business. If a web page takes 30 seconds to load, you are completely toast. Just keep that 20 seconds in mind. 80% lost in 20 seconds. Okay? So now we'll move on from the area of web to the area of telephone. Uh, support and things like that. Okay, so here we are on a call. How long does it take for the call to be answered? Switchboard. Customer switchboard. Well, do you get through to a human being or not? Not quite sure. Okay, let me ask you another question. 
Put your hands in the air if when you phone a utility company because they've got your bill wrong yet again and they press one for accounts, press two for this, press three for that, you get really angry. Put your hands up if you get really angry when you get put through to a utility company that does that. Right. Now you know what's coming. So here is an odd situation for us. An odd situation for us where I can tell you in common with all other telcos and most other banks in the world, we install systems which we know make us extremely angry when we're customers, correct? You've just shown me that. I, I ask a second question at many conferences. I've, I've polled 20,000 people in the last oh, couple of years, I should think, on this question. Say, put your hands in the air if these kinds of phone systems make you really hopping mad. And they all wave their hands. I say, put your hands in the air if you think that people who install such systems are social criminals and should be put in prison. They oh, yes, absolutely. And then they say, put your hands in the air if your own customers are subjected to such a ghastly situation. Up they go. So what kind of madness is that? What it's about is institutional blows. It's when we allow technology and the bottom line to, uh, to cloud our judgment because we know that actually it's not that expensive to intercept the call appropriately. It's not that expensive for Ahmed to put in a system where you, voice, uh, you, you recognize the call coming in. You, you know the kind of customer I am. You can guess the top three reasons why I'm likely to need help. And you can send me directly through to the right department using predictive technology based on my last billing and just about everything else you know about me. You should be able to get me more or less through directly to Julia on the first, first answer. Isn't that correct? This is not rocket science. We have had these technologies for 15 years. Okay, so here's another example. Um, and put your hands in the air if you've, if you've had trouble in the last two years getting your mobile device to synchronize with whatever it is, your Outlook or your Lotus or things like that. Put your hands up. Um, oh, 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 my. No, no, listen. We need to turn the videotape off at this point because this is so secret we must never let this out of this room. See, here's the truth. And it's so of just about every group of CIA. You see, you're not ordinary people. You're not like my mother. <laughs> But you're selling to my mother. So what Ahmed is telling me is, listen, see, I come to Ahmed and I say, Ahmed, I've got a bit of problem. My mother is complaining that her latest smartphone doesn't work. Well, it does, but it doesn't communicate with her, whatever she's running, Windows Vista or Windows, whatever it is. And you smile very sweetly and you say, mm-hmm. And you say, have you been through to the helpline? You say, yes, my mother has spent, guess how many hours on the helpline? <coughs> No, no, she'll be back and back, and they tell her every now and then to reset the machine and call back again. It goes on for days and days, these things, don't they? Typically, days. So eventually, she gives up, and she says to me, so you go sort it out. <laughs> and then I'll come back to her, and I'll tell her, Mum, I've got something very sad to tell you. Oh, what's that, dear? She says, it doesn't work. What do, what do you mean it doesn't work? I know it doesn't work. I want you to fix it. Say, no, 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 no. There's no one that can make it work. So, well, why is that? Well, because there's bugs in the Windows operating system and there's various complexities and incompatibilities and all kinds of other things. And, 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 and the operating system is, is, is basically defective as well. So they've got a defective operating system on the handset. They've got Microsoft problems and a whole host of other issues, plus some other software on your machine. And quite frankly, it's hopeless. At which point she says, well, could you tell those people to stop selling the box which says on the outside, compatible with the following pieces of software, when it clearly is not? Is this ringing any bells or not? Huh? <laughs> Put your hands up if you think that this, uh, if this is an ethical problem of mis-selling. I do. I'm sorry, I do. Look, look, I'm not knocking you, okay? I had my first IT company back in 1978 using the world's first desktop PCs, long before Apple and IBM. Uh, I was installing systems all over the world by 1980. It was my first sabbatical for medicine, and I've been on sabbatical ever since. Okay? Then the systems were very unreliable. It was always a big joke. You get the operating system out, and you test it in the market, right? And every time they phone up, you say, oh, that's another bug detected. Thank you very much. And you try and sort them out. But the psychology has largely remained. So. My observation is this. I don't think we can continue like that for much longer. Why? Because people like Apple have started to set a new standard. And it's put the wind up people like Microsoft. And I think that 
I think that people like my mother are increasingly realize it's part of a human right. If you buy a box, it should work. Correct? And it should not be sold if people inside the organization have PhDs in IT and computing also struggle to get the same things to work. So I think we're going to need a new standard when it comes to customer experience uh, that goes way beyond anything we've thought about before. And those that do it, my friends, will survive. And that do, those that don't will be dust. Thank God for that. So, we talk about convergence. Well, I mean, life's too short, isn't it, to buy stuff that doesn't work? Okay, we talk about convergence, but actually I think that we need to think beyond convergence. Here is a convergent product. It's a fridge which has an internet screen on the front of it, which is marvellous, except when you're trying to open the milk to get fridge, when your son is trying to surf the internet. Put your hands up if you like one of these. Uh, here is another wonderful piece of convergent technology. This is a surfboard which allows you to get your email and catch the next wave at the same time. <laughs> it's fantastic. It doesn't cost very much. In fact, I think they're more or less having to give them away now because there's no function for it. And here is another set of devices which are diverging. That is to say they have not yet converged onto this. Now, I'm sure you all have one of these because they only cost two euros each. Put your hands up if you have thrown your old remotes in the bin and you've gone for one unified convergent solution in your home. One, two. Now remember, you're not typical. You are at the cutting edge of new technology. You are at the, at the, at the epoch of innovation. But we have to keep the old one as well. <laughs> <laughs> now what I'm interested in is, I'm just the same. I bought a new one. I, I've got one that does everything. It turns on the, the, uh, the, 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 the home cinema. It does, uh, but do I use it? No, I don't know quite why, but I think, I'm, I, think I must be emotionally attached. <laughs> yeah. See, the future isn't about convergence or divergence. The future is about emotion. It's this irrational stuff which gets in the way of the old technology story. I say the old technology story because actually all real innovation is not about convergence at all. All real innovation is obviously about divergence. I'm so bored with cars, aren't you? Cars, they all look the same. You go around the car park, I lose my car, I can't find it. Why is that? I have to look for the registration number. Why? Because all cars these days are, are, are grey, they're all designed in wind tunnels, and they all look the same. And if you don't believe me, just go buy What Car magazine, and you look at these four models of four different manufacturers lined up, you know, comparing their features, and they're almost identical in every way. That's what convergence does. It removes choice, it destroys any kind of variety in life. It just means everything is the same. That is literally converged. So every Vodafone phone looks the same. Every phone package looks the same as your competitors. Absolutely everything, everywhere, all the time, great. But all real innovation will be about understanding Julia's customers better than anyone else and why they're different from Simone's customers and finding unique ways to serve them better and doing it consistently every single time because you can be sure that if Juan finds a way to, to do it, then everyone else in your country will start to do the same. Correct? So you, everyone will converge onto your success, so you have to invent the future again. And if we are just going to converge on, on, price, uh, on price and quality, well actually what tends to happen is we converge first on product spec and quality, and then we try and diverge on price because that's the only way we can make a difference, which means a spiral to the bottom on profitability, which is the most unpleasant place to run a business. So let's not go there. Let's think about divergence. I think about one massive area for divergence at the moment because it's so exciting, it's still relatively new, and hardly anybody is doing it well, and that is the cloud. 90% of all Microsoft's R&D is in cloud software right now. And this is huge. It is an unimaginably big leap for most large corporations. And most corporations know they've got to do it. In fact, they're following us. And put your hands up if you've got your own systems, personal so software or photos or videos in the cloud. So we have already raced there. Our customers are in the cloud. There's nothing new about it. But corporations are still scared about it. Why? Because they need hand-holding from people like Vodafone to show them that they can do this safely and in a secure way without losing their jobs. I want to think about another area of potential innovation, which is this. 
I want you to imagine a hypothetical partnership announced this morning at 9 a.m. between Vodafone, American Express, Nokia and Google. What would that be about? I want you to imagine this, this partnership threw shivers down the spines of every one of your telecom competitors and wrong-footed most of the other banking and financial organisations in the world and was one of the most important plays that Google has ever made. What would it be? Of course it would be about payments and it would be about being able to control a payment market which is worth a fortune. Just look at the UK alone. Transactions of more than 600 billion a year on cards, 60 billion of debt, uh, great interest rates, 2% commissions alone would be a market worth 12 billion. What would happen if we could capture that with a unique payment system? Uh, let's suppose uh, we create a completely secure system uh, with uh, biometrics as well. You put your thumbprint on, it comes at the same time as the SMS, uh, authorised under EU banking law to, to, to transact up to 100,000 euros in value on a single click, because it's biometric. So you can buy a boat, you can buy a car, pre-arranged finance of course. Uh, oh, and the deal is you get everything for free. What do I mean by that? You see, imagine a future we know that the cost of telco is falling towards zero. It really is. In terms of the actual uh, cost per gigabyte of bandwidth or uh, the cost per, per gigabyte of memory or, or, or the cost of a phone. or uh, Telecom costs are basically a disappearing uh, entity, which is why we keep on improving the spec and hoping people consume more. At the same time, the value of financial transactions is increasing exponentially, the amount that we could capture of those billions we saw just now. Imagine an inflection point, and we can debate in what year it comes, but clearly it will, when you could actually provide all the telco you wanted in the world so long as people stop using banks. Let's imagine the, the sales pitch. The sales pitch is a bit like this. See, you come to me, so Julia comes to me and she says, Patrick, this is the latest offer. Um, Tip all your cards onto the table, and you can keep one. I said, okay, I keep American Express. Well, that's fine, it's part of the partnership. You can keep one, and you're allowed to make up to £1,000 of transactions in any month, but that's, it's your emergency card, okay? All the other cards are toast. Tear them up. If you'll tear them up now before you leave, then I will sign a contract with you. <coughs> it will be a rolling contract. You can cancel it at any time with three months' notice. But what you're, telling, what you're allowing us to do is to use exactly the same technology, the same little grain of sand here, the RFID chip, is in the phone, and a whole load more. And what we, what we do is we, 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 do, we do all the transactions, so just don't worry about a thing. And we all capture everything, and it's all biometric and totally secure. Um, and if you do that, we will, we will provide for you the following. A free handset every 12 months, and another one for your household. So two free handsets unlimited calls and an unlimited video. We will also provide you satellite, courtesy of, of, uh, of, of Sky if you wish, or you can have Virgin Cable, whichever you wish. Uh, it, we, will, we will provide you unlimited movies from Love Film and, uh, and, uh, and one or two other things as well. You give you unlimited space for photographs online, but not videos because that's a little bit more expensive at the moment. But next year it will be videos as well. And all of this, really as much as you can have. Oh, by the way, do you have an iPad? No. Would you like something like that? We're very happy to give you an iPad or a Kindle or a look-alike equivalent, one per household thrown in. Um, and actually we can also provide you a net computer if you'll stay with us for more than 24 months. You say, what? Well, how comes all of that? Don't worry about it. There's no cost to you. It's just that it's actually paid for out of the stupid commissions that these wretched people have been charging out from the banks. So we, we cream it all off and we give a benefit back to you. Now, I've been, I've been showing that scenario for the last four or five years to many of the largest banks in the world. Okay? Now, I've been showing it to telcos for the last eight or nine years. And to telcos, I say it's about time you became banks. To the banks, I say it's about time you became telcos. Someone needs to stitch this together. And of course, it's now happening to some degree. Put your hands up if you think we could see a point of inflection where such a scenario could take place at some point in the future. It would be possible to provide an incredibly generous digital package, technology package, in return for, for the finances. Put your hands up if you think it could happen in the next, say, 10 years. Okay. Well, you're in common with the vast majority, 90-95% of every audience I've ever spoken to who's in these businesses, would say, absolutely, this is a no-brainer. Now, the thing is about no-brainers is that no-brainers do tend to happen. 
So the big question is, let's think about what, will, what the world will look like when it does. Okay? Now, you see, most debates about the future are not about what's going to happen. It's so obvious, isn't it? It's only about when. We can debate about whether this can't really happen in 2035. <laughs> or whether it's actually 2015. I couldn't care less. I'm a futurist. Time doesn't matter. No, that's not true. It does matter. But now we're in the debate. Let's consider what happens to telco after this. Because you stop selling telco. Well, the idea of selling bandwidth is history. The idea of selling handsets is gone. Uh, the idea of selling contract is, is a little last century. Because the only thing we're actually selling is financial services and the rest is free. So... Regulation, yes, that's true. Regulators will regulate in favour of the customer for anything that makes sense, that is secure, and and is compliant. There's no problem with regulation. If, you, if you've got a problem with regulation, just sell yourselves out to Barclays Bank and let them do it for you. Okay, let's go on to TV just for a moment. I just want to think about the future of TV because it's so key to all this, and it's. Uh, you see, really, you see, what is telco about? The future of telco is simply, tel is simply video. There is no other future. Let me explain why. I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but just stay with me for a moment before you react. If you think of the amount of bandwidth that's taken with a voice call, it's what? How, how, many, how, many, uh, how many bits per second? 32K or a bit less? 32K of bandwidth. Video. This is low quality video. I mean, the kind of video we're getting on, say, BBC iPlayer in this country is so, so low, low at the moment. But just wait, it won't be long before we'll want it to stream one, two, three, or four gigabytes per hour routinely using mobile devices. As it is, you'll know that there is one site uh, that, that uh, YouTube and BBC iPlayer between them are responsible for over half of the entire bandwidth of the United Kingdom. And this is only the first day of the first week of the video age when it comes to digital streaming. Now, there's no way that voice will ever recover its market share. It cannot do so, nor can emails. So you are basically in the video streaming business. That is your business. That is a fact now. As everyone who's fool enough to offer unlimited as much as you can eat data contracts has already discovered, it's video, 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 video. So let's forget voice. Voice is history. We just fit it in the back <coughs> end of what little bits of bandwidth are left and we can give it away for free. We're basically in the, in, in the business of mobile video. And what does that do to our strategy? Well, firstly, it means that we need to consider not only banks as very important partners, but video companies too. Now let's look at the global demand for bandwidth. We're looking at around 250 terabits per second by 2016, 40 to 100 times growth in bandwidth over the next decade. Uh, at the moment, uh, we're already using 1 trillion kilowatt hours of energy. Um, in fact, the internet uh, worldwide is consuming around 4 or 5% of the entire energy consumption. All power worldwide is consumed by the internet. And a big chunk of it increasingly is mobile. Now, I know that you're very acutely aware of that, and you've got lots of EU strategies uh, to make your servers run cooler and things like that. So, okay, so having established that your primary future is in video, the big question then is, what kind of video and what else will people be doing? Here is an ad. It's become part of the TV experience. The TV knows what you're watching. Uh, the, the whole environment starts to fuse together. I took, these, I took this in a few seconds in Singapore just the other day. Uh, here is a woman who's decided that 40 seconds between the beginning of the escalator journey and the end is long enough to restart her TV program. 40 seconds. Why is that? 20 seconds is long enough to lose 80% of your business. So 40% is a very long time to watch a TV program. 40 seconds is too long to spend on an escalator doing nothing. So multitasking is a very important part of the future, and I'm fascinated to know what, where it will be in that process. You see, 60 to 70 percent of people are surfing web by watching TV, 29 percent are on their phones while watching TV, and so on. Here's an interesting photograph, but where is the individual? And by the way, who's paying for his, his bandwidth? 
and what kind of bandwidth is he using? How many contracts do you think he's got in that room? Well, you know what? Because this is an old photograph, I suspect, it's, he's, I suspect he's probably got something on there. He might have a dongle. He's a, this is a high-tech guy, isn't he? This is, this is a road warrior, you can tell. He's got, almost, he, he's got another contract in that. He's got a SIM in there. Uh, that looks to me like an iPhone. Um, he's got probably uh, a, a, a landline coming in with a broadband on it, hasn't he? With a wireless, with Wi-Fi somewhere in the house, probably under his desk. Um, so that's, what do we say? One, two, three, four. We're up to four at the moment. I wonder if he's got a separate phone contract. That's landline phone contract. That's five. Five separate billing relationships. But actually, he only wants one thing. I'm, I'm very interested, too, in where he is, um, his ecosystem. Where do you think he is? Where do most people do their email? I'm joking. On the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> so there's maybe another device with him, actually. He's gone out. He's holding something, and it isn't his iPhone. He must be using a BlackBerry. So he's in the loo doing his office email. <laughs> but joking aside, this is incredibly important. You see, you have insights that many people don't, because you have tracking data. You know where people are and what they do where they are. And you can combine that information with hundreds and thousands of other people, including traffic information, goodness knows what. I think this is a fascinating world to understand the entire ecosystem of the individual. And I'm not just interested in what other computers is using, I'm interested in what is near him. I'm not interested in where he is, you know that already, better than anyone. And you can plot him to within two or three metres. But I'm interested in what else is near him. I'm interested in the fact that uh, he walks into a cab, the cab sees his glasses because of the, of the RFID chip. The cab interrogates the glasses and finds they're like mine, they are bifocals, which tells them he's already more than 50 years old. Because he needs reading glasses, okay? He's more than 50. They see the label, it's a designer label, so they know that he's high, uh, he, he, he loves designer label equipment, he's over 50 years old, and these are male glasses. This is a guy. That's just for one chip. But you also know other things because you, you're controlling his phone. You're tracking the journey, and what's more, you know that in, in, the same, I, in the same vehicle, must be because they co-aligned two signals, is someone else on the Vodafone account who happens to be the taxi driver. Fascinating. And you may also now be able to get, make a big guess about where I'm going. You certainly know where I've been picked up from. We are, we are at the very, very start of a fascinating process, uh, which may violate some privacy uh, uh, concerns at the same time. Here's another example of integrated technology. Here is... Uh, uh, Coca-Cola, who I was with recently, and Coke uh, have uh, designed an app. The app allows you to order your own uh, mix of, of, uh, of juices or, or flavorings to create your own unique specialty drink. And once you walk towards one of these machines, if you're, if you're carrying a phone and the phone is on, the machine will see you coming and prepare your drinks. It says, hello, Patrick Dix, and welcome to Coca-Cola. The drink is being mixed for you. Why? Because it knows that you're coming. It won't necessarily pour it, because, of course, you haven't made the decision yet, but it's anticipating the decision. It's saying, look, your favourite drink is ready now. Press play. And by the way, where's the bill? Oh, Vodafone captured the bill, of course. So, it's a fascinating world. Finally, I just want to go into Google. Why, why, why social networking came just in time to save Google and what the impact is on Vodafone? The reason why social work and networking came just in time is because Google's search engines were being significantly threatened, along with Yahoo and everyone else, by hundreds of thousands of spammers in places like India and China who are spamming networks by jamming up with all kinds of, or all kinds of, of false sites and goodness knows what else. And the only way to kick back against all the crap that was emerging on the internet was to galvanise the biggest democratic exercise the world has ever known and to combine the the digital intelligence and insights of, of over one or two billion people and their behaviours and their preferences and their challenges and their interests to guide the engine in what is actually real and what was just robotic. And uh, in the same time, of course, social networking has created um, an obsession with truth. Uh, why is that? Because uh, we're so fed up with the stuff we've been having which has been untruth, uh, things that have been uh, uh, sold that don't work, things that are unreliable, things that are deceptive, things that are not quite what they appear. So trust has been the number one issue, especially in the recent crisis. If you don't have trust, you don't have a bank. If you don't have trust as a government, you don't have a country. 
as the European Union has discovered, if you don't have trust in a euro, an entire currency disappears. So trust is the most dominant force in the world. Why? Because it's the same thing as inertia. It's still tied to the same thing. So what does it all mean? Well, with Facebook now having one trillion page views a month, this has been a fertile area to develop trust. So that's where Google's gone. Well, tried to get into Facebook, but couldn't. Others have. But it's Google's territory, its natural territory, is social networking. Now, why does this matter? I'll tell you why. Because it's put an extra spring in the step of a process that was already happening. I'm sure many of you have been on TripAdvisor. Put your hands up if you have. Okay, put your hands up if, uh, if you would go straight to this one. You've got two, three choices. You can go straight to this one, having typed in the name of your London hotel where you're staying tonight. You can go straight to this one that comes up first on the listings, or second to that one, or you can press the ad on the right-hand side for the official uh, website of the hotel chain. Which would you go on first? Put your hands up if you go first for the honeymoon suite. Come on. One, two, three, four, five. Put your hands up if you first. You go to the rats every single time. And put up your hands up first if you don't believe any of those, and you go straight to the official site. It's interesting, there's a broader mix than there is in most audiences. In most audiences, 90 to 95% will always go for the rats. Why is that? Uh, by the way, we know uh, who wrote this one. The hotel, thank you, yeah, of course. There was a student at Imperial College who was paid five pounds by his father to do it, but there we are. Um, and what about this one here? Who wrote this one? Competitors. Yet, you'll find that most people will still go for one of these. They know that they're probably not true, but they still want to go. What this tells us, once again, is that the future is not about truth, it's about emotion. And Google has given that a fantastic spring. So, why? Because we connect with the... We believe the opinions of strangers more than we do anyone else in the world, including the British government, or the American government, or indeed the CEO of Vodafone. So if a report comes out suggesting that mobile phones cause a much higher incidence of medical problems in small children than we'd ever imagined, and the CEO comes out and says, we've looked at the research and it is clearly nonsense, uh, will the CEO be believed, or do you think that this kind of background chatter online will be believed? Which do you think? Background chatter, yes, every single time. And now we're seeing the background chatter is actually ranking ads, uh, so it's actually even hard to, uh, if you can't trick the search engines, it's hard to even trick the ad, ad machines through things like Trustpilot and the rest. So what's the message? The message, I think, is that we can have all the technology in the world and we're going to hear lots about it. And I know that we'll continue to be at the forefront of technology innovation. I have no doubt about that. My question is, from time to time, whether we need to do a reality check and what that reality check will show and whether or not the city we're building will land up the, the right shape and size for the citizens of tomorrow. For me, what it's all about is making life better. That's what it's all about. It's about putting the customer first, and as we do that, we will find ourselves in a fantastic place. When you have world-class innovation and a world-class customer experience, believe me, there's hardly anyone on earth that's able to do both of those. So I wish you all the best. Thank you. Now, what I'd like to do, we're going to go straight on, straight in there, and I want to, just for two or three minutes, I want you to shout out things that you are feeling as I went through that. Threaten? Yeah. Hmm? Slow. Slow. Excited. Excited. Oh, yeah, by the way, I don't believe everything I say, you know that. <laughs> I'm sure you worked that out. My, my aim is to provoke us to fresh thinking today, because otherwise there's no point in coming here. Yeah. Authentic. Hmm? Authentic. Authentic. Okay. Introspective. Hmm? Introspective. Introspective. Challenge. Challenge. One more. It needs to work. Needs to work. Okay. Now, let's just turn a page. Random thoughts triggered by the process. When you think about strategy, or you think about the future, or you think about positioning, or you think about your customers, go for it. Opportunity. 
Opportunities, thank you. I'm thinking about the industry. What kind of competition, yeah. What kind of company should we do? What kind of company? To retain customers. Who pays? Services <laughs> first. Um, services first. Challenges of implementing and then managing it operational. Be on time. Yes, I, I, I said something I don't believe in. Timing is absolutely critical in the region of the future. We can debate about the timing, but it's absolutely... Seamless to the customer. Yes. Most customers couldn't care less. They just wanted to go. Customer understanding. Okay, two or three more. Simplicity. Smart. Smart. Disruptive change. Yeah. What will the customer be willing to pay for? Yes. Should we partner with our competitors? Interesting, yeah. Device and connectivity. IT and connectivity. How to make the difference. What we sell today will disappear, yes. Okay, great. Now, what, I'll tell you what we're going to do now. We're going to change gear a little bit. What we're going to do is we're going to hold those things in our minds. The purpose is not to sort of solve your business unit problems. The purpose is to leave them behind, to forget them if we can for an hour or two. Uh, because you'll be back in the middle of all the challenges deep inside different parts of the businesses in the rest of this week. But what we're going to do now is uh, for the rest of the day we've got several other strategy pieces. We've got three actually still to come. Uh, Chris is going to kick off with the overarching strategy, you're going to have then the IT strategy and then there's, I think there's an enterprise strategy as well. Um, and then we're going to have a panel which will stitch all these things together. And I'm going to ask a question when we get to the panel, which is in the light of everything you've heard, is this that? Right? In the light of what you, you yourselves have put on these boards as some of the biggest challenges in the wider context, are the things that you are hearing and the things that you're working with within the business at the moment, within the vision and the structures and the strategies that you have, going to deliver what you think, in your opinion, will be needed to satisfy that?